All right, awesome. You ready for the, I hope, uh, last class of the semester? Or do you have another lecture after this? Okay, I guess. It's the last one. Good. Thank you for not making me feel bad about my joke. I am in great responsibility. <laughs> All right. Um, let's talk a little bit about quasars in our last lecture. Quasars and um, a little bit of you know what lies beyond. So the third Cambridge oops, catalog of radio sources. C3 was published in nineteen fifty-nine. I like uh, the whole uh, story and all the development, scientific developments behind the discovery and eventual understanding of quasars, because I think it's very um, illustrative of how the scientific method works. So uh, this catalog uh, mapped the whole um, sky in the 159 megahertz band. So radio that's well, still relatively a, a new technology, right? Um, it had been used in World War II. The first television images were from, I guess, the Berlin Olympic Games. So this was uh, relatively uh, new. So there were two sources, 3C48 and 3C273 that were just there with no corresponding um, optical body or, or star. So all the other ones, you could see the, uh, the radio spectrum and you knew which star it belonged to. These two were not there. So what are possible explanations for not having an optical uh, partner or counterpart? Brown dwarf or quasar? Brown dwarf or what? Quasar. Okay, so Picture yourself in 1959. Aliens. <laughs> yep. Um, it's never aliens until it is. It's always the last hypothesis. So the technology, so brown dwarfs had not been detected. Uh, the technology didn't exist. Quasars were unimagined at the time. No, nobody thought that, that that could be a thing. So, you know, thinking about the possibilities, we know that um, stars have a black body spectrum. Uh, 
So this will be the radio over here. And you have, you know, a lot of intensity over there, but you don't see anything in this part, you know, in the, in the visible. So, and you know, this is at 159 megahertz, so it's only one cut. But you know that um, at least you know, there's not much over here. The intensity is not enough to be detected with an optical telescope. Um, you know, you can think that this will be valid, I think, that it's just some narrow band, you know, you happen to be detecting there. Um, what looks like this, what spectrum looks like this, maybe with more over here. This could be a, a gas cloud, right, with emission lines, like narrow. And we know from 21 centimeter radiation that uh, the gas clouds do radiate. So, okay, you know, maybe, maybe it's some sort of, of cloud. Using several telescopes, so the advantage of um, radio astronomy is that with certain uh, signal processing techniques, you can combine the observations from uh, telescopes that are far away, radio telescopes. And even though you do not collect as much photons as if you had a continuous telescope, uh, it still gives you like the focal range of a big telescope. So you know, using several radio telescopes, it was determined that the radiation was coming from a point, single point. And that's kind of where the problem started because all the, the gas clouds that we know about are not points. You know, they have, we, we, can, we can see their, uh, their length you know, with, with, the, with telescopes. So this is radiation in a narrow band coming from a single point. So you know, not terrible, but not something that they could explain, explain um, readily. So this was in the late 50s. In 62, using occultations of the moon, they found uh, an optical counterpart for 3C uh, to, um, yeah, to 23 found. And in 1963, just directly, they found the 3C48 counterpart. So they knew where the radio source was in the sky, and they, you know, someone realized that it was going to go behind the moon. So if you're looking at the bright sky, in the you know, optical, then you could see which source or which optical source disappears, and then you can look at it. That's what they did, and they detected the the optical counterparts. So, in both cases, they found. Uh, I'm going to put it over here. Quotation marks, uh, star, blue star. 
Uh, it was also, they were both very faint. So what was very interesting about this uh, star, or these two stars, was that they could not map the, the emission and absorption peaks you know, of the different elements to anything that was known. So that's kind of cool. What would you have thought at, at the time? You type the star? Yep, like what kind? You know, well, we have, we have to model it now. It's nothing that we knew of, so I don't know. Yeah. Does an alloy have different spectral lines? So you repeat Maybe with new elements. Maybe what? With new elements. New elements, yeah. Definitely a possibility. Uh, new star. Well, nature seems to have a better imagination than us. We are contained, so I would say so. Mostly, you know, we observe things and they're like, oh, wow, new things, instead of, well, I'm, I'm going to imagine, I'm going to try to imagine new stars. Um, but yeah, there was. Does Plato would uh, have a counter argument for that, but <laughs> it's weird. I'm not saying it again. It's a kind of old concept, but it's funny. Okay, Boomer. Wait, was Plato no. a boomer? <laughs> what? Was Plato a boomer or no? <laughs> I even say. No. I, I, I don't know how to, how to respond to that. <laughs> okay, so there was, there were a few uh, things about the spectrum. So, a regular star is going to look like that, and it's going to have, you know, some emission peaks, or maybe some absorption peaks. So this one looked like this. So it looked like this part you know, of the of the black body radiation, but almost all the intensity was at very long wavelengths, so very low energy. And the peaks were uh, they're they're really really broad. They're not narrow like these ones. So you know, definitely a new kind of star or a new, you know, uh, unknown phenomenon who produce this. Um, but almost for sure it was not a star, um, you know, as we think of them or as we know them. So, the other thing, I guess I'm over here. Eventually, I guess it was the same, the same year, it was 1963. Uh, they realized that they could fit the peaks to regular hydrogen, but redshifted by like 16%, which was very substantial. The other thing is that some of the of the peaks you will not expect to see from a star because the star is very dense and so it is opaque to uh, certain wavelengths. But you know, this uh, spectrum was created by something that was not very dense. So the facts. Okay. Let's see if we can 
use a different color. Not dense. Uh, point like source. And red shifted. So these were the three things that you know any any explanation or any model had to explain. So the red shifted in particular. Could be created by a very strong gravitational field or something moving, so uh, general relativity, or something moving really fast, so special relativity. We, I guess, nobody knew, you know, um, about a, a process that will explain all of these things. So, if the source was inside of our galaxy or very nearby, then in order to uh, achieve that redshift, the star or whatever it was will have to be moving at 47,000 kilometers per second which is about it's like 15% of the speed of light or something like that. So you're know, thinking about the, the virial theorem and how the stars or a cluster or a galaxy, uh, they thermalize and relax. There's, there was, you know, there's still no known, known uh, process that can produce a star or a body moving with this speed uh, inside the galaxy. So, you know, that provides some evidence that uh, it's either something that is really far away. So, um, Hubble's observations in the 20s and 30s, you know, people already knew that the universe was expanding or had a pretty good, pretty good, uh, uh, idea of that. So it's either something that is really, really far away, like a, a galaxy, or uh, it's a strong uh, gravitational field. The gravitational field is difficult because if you have a star that is so massive that it redshifts the light by so much, the this, this star will not be stable. But if it, is a, if it is of galactic origin, so if it is a galactic source, then you need a new process that can produce the amount of, uh, of energy you know, being put out by this, by this thing. So it's really far away. You know, you, if, if you redshift it and it's still producing, you know, like you, you can still detect it as a, as a regular star, although only in the, in the radio. So, you know, there, there's definitely some, some issues with every possible explanation. So the third possibility is that there is new loss of nature. Right? So maybe a, a new force, a new interaction that we didn't know about. Always a, a possibility. But people tend to stick with things that they know well first before going out looking for uh, completely you know, like new physics. So 
They were called quasars for the first time. So quasi-stellar uh, source. In um, 1964 Physics Today article. Is this only one L? I don't know. I think so. Um, so it's kind of fun to see how um, you know, they went from quasar to pulsar and magnetar. I guess they started liking this AR uh, suffix in the um, astrophysics community. So in 64 and 65, In 64, they found two new sources. So with the same characteristics, you know, the same spectrum. And in 65, uh, five new ones. You know, so the evidence is starting to pile up. There's, in a similar way as with the velocity rotation curves, right? There's something that you have to explain. You have to come up with, with something. So the 3C two seventy three. They realized that the optical counterpart is bright enough that they could find it in uh, the archives of you know, old telescopes. So going as, as far back as like the 1900s. And here by putting all of that together, they realized that the luminosity was variable. But it varied um, in less than a year or approximately one year. So that puts a limit, you know, because the signal cannot travel faster than than the speed of light. And you know, any interaction is probably going to be somewhat slower than the speed of light. That puts a, a limit on how big the, the object can be. So they realize that it, it, these objects have to be less than one light year in size. So they're pretty big. If you put it in our galaxy, it will be huge. Uh, but if it's something that you know, is ref redshifted by 14% and is one light year in size, that's pretty tiny. Like this has to be a very powerful uh, process you know, that, is, that is creating this radiation. So you know, the object, the objects are uh, compact. The final observation based on this historical data is that the objects didn't move uh, with respect to the to the background, the galactic background. So you know, overall, there was quite a bit of evidence it was piling up that these had to be objects that were outside of the Milky Way. Um, I guess the problem started being, you know, what can create uh, such radiation. This is not 
rare. And, you know, after you discover an object, you, know, you go back to the historical record and you find that you know, the star or the object was there before, but nobody noticed. So, you know, if we do uh, optically discover planet nine, then probably you, know, you will you will be you, you will see that it was in other uh, photographs that were taken before, but you know, nobody knew what they were. So this this is common. So you know we have the the facts. So they are compact objects. They produce a lot of radiation in the radio, but not in the visible. The emission lines are redshifted to extremes and they do not move. So, if the object is in the galaxy. So the advantage of this is that the, the process that is creating it, that is producing the radiation, doesn't have to be something outside of known processes. But you know the, the cons is that in order to explain the redshift, this will have to be you know too massive of an object to be stable. And it cannot really explain if this is a if it is inside the galaxy, it has to be very dense. So uh, cannot explain the some of the forbidden uh, emission lines. So the second hypothesis is that the object is not in the galaxy. So it's also your problems with being compact and uh, being redshifted. Um, the cons is that you know, no known mechanism can produce uh, the radiation. So there were you know, some other explanations for the mechanism. Um, I don't think any of them were exploring too much depth, but you know, people saw that it could be uh, interacting matter and, and antimatter. And you had a galaxy in which you had both and they were producing all these energy. Definitely a possible. Or that it was a white hole. So you know, the the end um, part of the uh, of a wormhole. Uh, but you know we know that those would be pretty unstable. Uh, but you know pe people had other other ideas. I think a pretty cool one was that it was a chain reaction of uh, supernovae explosions. So you had a lot of very massive stars very close to each other and one of them explodes and that destabilizes the whole cloud. Um, I think it will be unlikely, but not, not impossible. So,
in 64. Um, Edwin Salpeter. And Yakov. Sell the page independently. Uh, propose that perhaps the radiation was produced by matter in an accretion disk falling to a supermassive black hole. And what do you think was the reaction of the scientific community? They thought it was ridiculous, probably. <laughs> they laughed at him. Yeah, I think they did. That's the best guess always. So the scientific community was, I guess they, they didn't like the, even Albert Einstein, right? He didn't like the idea of black holes. Uh, there was no observational uh, evidence for black holes. And so they, they were believed not to exist. So this was as crazy a solution as the other ones, right? Like uh, matter, antimatter or something. Um, but it, it has a lot of, of pros. It explains the forbidden emission lines. So the, the accretion disk can be of low density, at least in um, some areas, the ones that are further away. So they can produce um, the radiation that, can, that will be opaque to stars. It explains the power spectrum. Um, and it provides you know, an origin for it. It explains the lack of um, apparent motion. So these are things that are really far away. Um, apparent motion. They explain you know, the fact that are point-like, again, because they are very far away. And in addition to all of that, well, obviously explains the redshift, it explains the large broadening of the redshifted peaks. So you have a pretty, because the acceleration is so, so large and you're very close to some of these matters really close to the, dark, uh, the black hole, the velocity range of the particles is pretty, it's pretty big. And as we saw before, the finite uh, broadening or line width of the, of the emission lines is due to, uh, if you look at a star, it's due to the temperature. Over here, you know, it's just because they're moving towards, accelerating towards the, the black hole. So it's a pretty good theory. It explains everything. Um, people didn't believe you know, uh, in it at the beginning, um, at least. So the, the bad thing about this one is that, yeah, nobody had detected a, a black hole. Um, in 1964, uh, the military, I assume, um, 
launch a suborbital rocket from White Sands. And it had a Geiger counter. So it went, and not, it didn't leave the Earth or anything, um, but it went high up enough that uh, it could detect uh, X-ray sources or X-rays. Here on Earth, we are protected uh, by the uh, by the atmosphere that absorbs all the X-rays. The only issue with that is that we cannot observe in the X-ray. You know, we cannot do science um, from inside the atmosphere, unfortunately. That was a joke. Anyways. So it detected Cygnus uh, X1, so first X-ray source in the constellation of Cygnus. So after that, um, they, uh, again, I'm not sure if it was NASA, but it was probably the military. So they had two of these rockets, suborbital rockets, and they just went you know, around the, the Earth uh, several times, and they were rotating. And so the Geiger counter was you know, facing the outside at certain times. And in that way, they were able to uh, do an initial survey of X-ray sources in you know, outside of, of the Earth. They detected eight of them, including the signals uh, which uh, they, they knew about. So why are X-ray sources interesting, perhaps unexpected? Well, Even the more massive stars, the like O and B stars, uh, they do not produce X-rays. You know, they're just not the, the the process is not energetic enough. So remember that these ones create the strong grain spheres uh, because they radiate in the UV. So you know, UV is still pretty far away from from X-rays. What can produce X-rays, natural sources of X-rays? Quasars. Yeah, but you know about quasars. <laughs> I know that's, that's kind of that's what like one of your jokes. I know. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> mm, merging stars can also make X-rays. Which ones? Like mergers, mm -hmm. like when stars collide. Yeah, mergers. Or supernovas. Uh, supernovas, correct. Uh, but the issue with these ones is that they are transient, right? So they don't last for too long. Like a supernova might last you know, one or two days, something like that. Um, a merger you know, might, lie, might last a little longer, but it doesn't last for, you know, eons. So, you know, just based on the number of stars in the Milky Way, you really will not expect, you know, you might get lucky, of course, but um, maybe you will detect one supernova, right? But eight of these sources, you know, just in the sky, it's uh, difficult to explain. And then you go, so eventually, I guess it was um, 1970, the satellite uh, Uhuru was launched. So, Uhuru was in orbit for three years, 
Um, you had more sophisticated detectors than, than just a Geiger counter. And it studied these uh, sources of, of, of x-rays for, for longer. So these are not transient uh, sources. So you know, there's no, now by you know, mid 1960s or so, you know that there's some process, some phenomenon that is creating energetic radiation that it's difficult to explain uh, or I guess impossible with, with the current uh, theoretical models. So uh, Uhuru studied this, uh, these sources and it found that there are variations in the intensity with time. Um, and they are they're not completely periodic, but you know, maybe something like that. So this time scale over here is about one second. So you have variations in the intensity that are smaller than one second. And you know, again, these limits, because of the speed of light, how big this object can be. And you know, with current instruments, you can detect you know, like small variations within the, the variations. So um, like the like Chandra, right? the X-ray observatory. So Cygnus is still the, the best studied source of X-rays. Um, so they have detected variations that are less than a millisecond. And so with those, they try to um, understand the effect of, uh, of chaos. And so there's the the matter is not falling into uh, sickness uh, at a steady pace, but there are um, there's some chaotic behavior of the of the particles, and you can see that in the variations of the intensity that are sub millimeter. So you know, kind of kind of cool. So in 1971, after after Uhuru uh, was able to um, know exactly where this source of X-rays was located. In 71, they found an optical counterpart. So the really cool thing about this optical counterpart is that um, it is a blue giant. But we know that blue giants, you know, no star, can produce x-rays. So in that same year, they um, realized that they, they looked at the uh, the Doppler shift in the with, with the motion of the of the blue giant. So they realized that it was a binary system. The blue giant was uh, one member, and there was something else that was not visible um, with a mass of about. 14 uh, to 16 solar masses. So this cannot be anything else, you know. Uh, the, the most massive neutron stars are about three solar masses. 
I mean, that's the theoretical limit. I think observationally, the biggest one is like two. So this cannot be something, it cannot be anything else but a black hole. So, you know, this is already the 70s, but people are starting to, to give it some serious, some serious consideration. Um, because if the blue giant is giving matter to sickness and it's creating uh, the accretion disk and everything, then it can produce the, the x-rays and the, the, the spectrum profile that is observed. So, also in the 70s, um, computer simulations really took on. And so you know, they were able to predict you know, to very, very good detail the observations here. So in the you know, early 70s, mid 70s, the scientific community was like, okay, there's nothing else that can explain uh, this phenomenon. And if we assume that black holes are real and we have all these predictions from theory and, and simulations that agree with the observations, all right, I mean, you, I guess it's uh, as far as you can go without actually going there and touching the black hole, right? So, in yeah, the middle of the 1970s, people were fairly convinced that black holes uh, were real or cool exist and that Cygnus X1 was one of them. So, Sickness is is uh, these black holes with accretion disks and and uh, X-ray emission. Uh, sometimes they're called uh, micro quasars. So the same physics that we see in quasars, we see it at a smaller scale because these are smaller black holes. Um, in you know, black holes like Cygnus. So uh, also we uh, with satellites that can you know, study X-ray sources. Uh, the scientific community realized that quasars were producing not just uh, radio uh, emissions. But they also produce um, emission in the in the X rays, even though uh, it is redshifted, right? So you can imagine how energetic these things are. So right now, there's something like two hundred fifty thousand known quasars. Um, luckily, there's no quasars close to us. And all of them are, are very red shifted. So they were much more common earlier in the life of, of the universe. So was the Milky Way ever a quasar? I think Jacob, you asked this before. What do you guys think? Just because galaxies can be thought of as like being quasars in their early lives, is that what the only idea? Yeah, I think that's so. There's there is much more um, chaos, and I don't mean it in a technical term, but you know, there's more stuff going on uh, when the galaxy is just forming. So you still have a concentration of mass in the center. Uh, they're going to create 
supermassive black holes. And I think pretty much every galaxy that you look at, it has a, a supermassive black hole. And you know, there's just more dust, more, uh, more gas just moving around. And so more of it is falling into, into the black hole. Maybe two quasars disrupted the room. Could you repeat that? Maybe two quasars disrupted each other and like that's how a galaxy was formed, maybe? Yeah, I mean, they definitely have uh, a role in the, in the formation of galaxies. So there's, you know, uh, quasars are, I guess, a subset of uh, active galactic nuclei. So there are other things, you know, they're not necessarily as powerful as, as quasars, but you might have similar phenomena, right? Like maybe, you know, uh, a few tens of stars, you know, massive stars uh, being uh, disrupted and falling into the, the supermassive black hole, right? So that will produce some radiation. Uh, it will not have like a fully form uh, accretion disk necessarily, uh, but you will have some activity. Or you know, maybe you have two galaxies colliding and you have a bunch of stuff falling into them. They are also going to merge at some point, which will be really cool to detect. Um, so you know, there are other events that are not rigorously speaking quasars, but there's stuff going on in the nucleus and it's producing um, energetic radiation. And so in the Milky Way, um, you can see uh, some uh, uh, jets that were created by the supermassive black hole, um, I guess it's Sagittarius A, about 10 million years ago. So they're like several thousand uh, light years in size, you know, both above and below the Milky Way. So it was it is thought that it's created by you know, some some matter fell into or or even stars fell into the massive the supermassive black hole. So it is not active right now, but it has been active in the relatively recent past. So yeah, it's definitely possible that the Milky Way, you know, had a, a quasar um, early in its in its life. Uh, let's see. So yeah, I thought about all that stuff. So. Why is the night sky dark? Any ideas and also any ideas on why this is not a stupid question? Maybe because the light pollution we have <laughs> dims out all the night stars. I don't think so. I mean, you, would, mean the, 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 you would have places on Earth where it wouldn't be dark, no? Yeah, that, that's a good point. But I mean, like, in general, you know, let's say that you go to the, to the moon. Why is mostly dark? Um, yeah, I'm thinking, why, why is this not a silly question? I mean, wh why would it not be dark? Like, there's, I, I don't think there's enough uh, light coming from like all of the universe. Why not? Uh, or, or getting to us, not coming, but getting to us, right? Because yeah. it's it's expanding and I mean, probably if the universe was infinite and, and not expanding at this point, we would probably have like stars everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be stars maybe. So this is called 
Olber's paradox, or Olber's state of sequence, what do you call it? So it is a paradox if you assume this, uh, I guess mostly two things. The universe is infinite in size, and the universe is infinite in time. Um, I guess, you know, if, if you wanted to cover all your bases, you could also say that the universe is homogeneous. Um, but, you know, even with these two, I think these are the stronger ones. One of them has to be uh, false, or both of them have to be false in order for this to be a paradox. For it to be a paradox or for it to be like... So if the, if the universe is infinite in size and infinite yes. in time, then there will have been enough time. For light from everywhere to reach us, right? Like. Yes. And so the, 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 the sky will not be dark. And you will see <laughs> light from all the other galaxies. So but the universe is expanding. Even if it is expanding. You know, if it is infinite in size. Well, doesn't redshift kind of come into this? Like, doesn't light eventually just dim down? Into, like, Not even things? dim down. We think that the universe is probably expanding faster than the speed of light at this point. So it, it, there's light that doesn't reach you coming in this direction that will never reach. Yeah, but over there, uh, so Jacob, with the, with the dimming, um, so with the red shifting, okay, let's let's changing a little bit. Why is it dark in the infrared or in the radio? You know, why we don't see radio waves everywhere? I guess we do see the microwave background. Um, yeah, but that's something else. <laughs> um, what is considered dark is the question. Dark infrared. And infrared. Because if you go, as he said, into microwave, you have the microwave uh, background radiation where like those pictures are, I, I, don't, I don't think they have many dark spots. There's no dark spots. Yeah, yeah that, that makes sense. <clears throat> the, the, the differences in, in intensity are like something times 10 to negative six. They're, they're very mm -hmm. small, it's very homogeneous. Um, but Adrian, you are kind of, you know, if, if you're, you're, you're saying that the universe is expanding and, and that at some point it's, it's traveling so fast that no light uh, is going to reach us. Well, beyond that, I think it's, uh, something, some things are, are far enough that they don't reach us. And that's why we have what we call an observable universe, right? Um, some things are already like far away that we'll never see from it. Yeah. I've seen some, uh, I, I guess I've read a few cool articles about how humans or I guess a, a civilization that arises in the Milky Way, uh, like I guess one order of magnitude more. So uh, when the universe is like uh, one times 10 to the 15 years old, for the most part, they will only see um, you know, and They're not going to see other, other galaxies. And people wonder if they'll be able to realize that the universe is expanding or that there are other uh, things that are outside of their observable um, galaxy, and this is a this, these are interesting questions because you know it, it 
gives you an idea of uh, our own situation. Like, is our Big Bang the only one? Probably not, but... Uh, anyways. What do you have to say? Probably not. I think there's, there's many uh, Big Bangs. But, you know, they're like just separated. Big Crunch kind of style, or...? What's that? Big Crunch kind of style, or like in the same spatial universe that there have been several Big Bangs that are sufficiently uh, far from each other? Yeah. Where? This, the latter. But, but, but why reason do we have to think one way or the other? Uh, you know, I, I guess if you start to think, this, this is mostly a, um, a Bayesian philosophy, right? Like, it's very unlikely uh, that yeah, things happen actually. only once. That we are the only one and just happen that we're here. It's much more likely that there are many universes, um, if you want to call them that way, many different Big Bangs in which the laws of physics are, um, the, 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 the interaction parameters like G or like the speed of light and all these things are slightly different and they produce universes that are, you know, if you observe them, it might be different, like maybe it will, uh, stars will not arise or things like that. Um, I think it's likely, and you know, I can, I, I, Weinberg has really, really uh, developed ideas on, on these. Um, but let me, let me just do something here. Okay. So the density of galaxies is about 10 to the negative two galaxies per cubic megaparsec. Each galaxy has about 10 to the 10 stars. So you get rid of your galaxies. And so you have about 10 to the 8 stars per cubic megaparsec. You know, if you consider that the universe is homogeneous, then, then it will look like this. So, um, I did my conversion factors over here to get to this value. There are 3.4, times 10 to the negative 60 stars per cubic meter. So not that many stars. So now, if you consider the cross section of a star, this would be, this is you know, n, the number density of stars. The cross section, let's say that is pi times solar radius squared, assuming that a star is about the size of, uh, of the sun. So this is uh, seven times 10 to the eight meters squared. So the cross section, is uh, 1.5 times 10 to the 18 meters squared. And with this, you can calculate the, uh, the mean free path. So one over um, and sigma, right, just like with all the other phenomena that we have seen. So it's this one times this one, so then you take the inverse, and it is 1.9 times 10 to the 41 meters. 
per star. So on average, this is how far away you have to travel in the universe to find a, to collide with a star. Isn't that a parsec or something? Uh, it's more than that. It's, uh, this is two uh, times 10 to the 25 light years. So one parsec is 3.2, so this is like, um, and then if it's megaparsec, that's six. So this is about something like one times 10 to the 19 megaparsecs. So, you know, stars are not very common in the universe. So you will have to travel for a very, very long time before hitting one. But the cool thing is that this tells you that the size of the universe you know, with these very simple assumptions, um, the size of the universe is much smaller than two times 10 to the 25 light years. Otherwise, you will see most of the of the sky covered by stars, which we don't see. Uh, it also. Huh? What? Wait, how? So this is how far away, or how far you have to move. Yeah, yes. With frequentist statistics with no correlations, before uh -huh. you find a star. And you're talking about the size of the observable universe, right? Yes. Okay. okay. So if the universe were bigger than this, you know, much bigger, let's say a hundred times this, then most of the star most of the sky will be covered by by stars because there will be so many. That is not true. And you know, this is indeed correct that the universe is much smaller than that. Uh, you can also calculate it in terms of the time because the speed of light um, is constant. So you know, the time is just this length, this uh, mean free path, uh, this one in meters, uh, divided by the speed of light and you get 6.3 times 10 to the 32 seconds, which is um, 2 times 10 to the 26 years. So the universe, it's much younger than two times into 26 years. And indeed it is, right? It is uh, uh, 1.4 times 10 to the 10. So it is 16 orders of magnitude younger. But if one of these were true, so the universe is about this size uh, or older than this, you will see most of the sky or all of the sky covered by, by stars. So this tells you that we live in a small and young uh, universe, still, still young. So this is the last thing that I'm going to mention is Hubble's law. He did not come up with it, but it is based on his work. I think the Maitre is the one who did it. Um, just as the velocity, the apparent velocity of a galaxy is equal to Hubble's constant times the distance between the Milky Way and that galaxy. 
So this is Hubble's um, parameter or constant. Often you will see it as constant, as constant, but it actually changes with time. So the value, and this is kind of easy to do. Uh, H naught is the proportionality constant between the velocity and the distance. So it's just the slope. And you'll see, you know, the observations of galaxies. Uh, you estimate the distance from the redshift and you, you measure the, uh, sorry, you get the, the distance from like, um, um, uh, supernovas, um, and then the velocity from, from the redshift. And so that constant is 70, kilometers per second per megaparsec. So for each megaparsec that this galaxy is away from us, the velocity at which it is receding is 70 kilometers per second. So this has several implications. Perhaps the main one is that If they are receding at 70 kilometers per second, at some point they were all together. So that's the that's the Big Bang. The Hubble time is one over h not. So it has units of kilometers per second per megaparsec. So this is distance and this is distance. So you can put them in the same units in meters and they cancel out. And so you end up with seconds. So the inverse of the Hubble constant is just the time. So If you put it in per seconds, it is 2.31 uh, times 10 to the negative 18. And if you take the inverse of this, then you get 1.4 times 10 to the 10 years. It's um, 4.3 times 10 to the 17 seconds. So 14 billion years. This is not how the age of the universe is calculated because you, know, you cannot be completely sure that uh, H naught has been constant throughout the existence of the universe, but it is definitely consistent with um, with observations of like um, uh, uranium and plutonium um, radioactive decay. So, yeah, this is much less than the other number that we calculated. Uh, the variations in the Hubble constant uh, tell you about uh, the effect of uh, matter or even dark matter and dark energy. So, you know, to a first approximation, this looks like a like a straight line, but if you look at the details, you know, there's, instead of being like this, 
there's like some um, the, a small difference so you know from these you can kind of estimate whether there is enough matter in the universe to produce a big crunch uh, or not and what has been observed is that you know, not only there's not enough matter but these are accelerating and this is where the idea you know, that of, of dark energy uh, comes from is the only way to explain uh, this this observation so i hope you enjoyed the the course you know i think we went from we, we covered a lot of ground a lot of physics and many orders of magnitude in terms of time and and space so i hope you had fun there is there is still uh, there's one discussion you know, due today and another one on thursday next week and if you have to you know, there's another or if you want to there's another um, research project that is due on the 13th all right so thank you very much for everything comments or anything thank you i will have a good holiday everyone thank you semester went flying jorge was that Dante? That the semester went on flying. I know, it's crazy. It was a blink of an eye. We were back in August. Yeah, it was, it was uh, very enjoyable for me to teach this course, even though you know, the person-to-person -person interaction was <laughs> uh, tough. Hopefully things will improve soon. I mean, it was good while it lasted. Hey, we're still we're still talking, so it's it's good. <laughs> All right, so thank you. See you later. Thanks for him. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. See you. Wait, if you want to like advance your or like see ways of.